Malachi chapter 3, please, and we'll read verse 8 down through 11. This church is well instructed, I know that, and uh, this is not something you haven't heard before, but I'm going to give you a couple of ideas tonight about how God enables his people to give. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can be here in this place tonight. I thank you, Lord, for this church and Brother Flores, Brother Young before him. And uh, thank you for these people, their faithfulness in serving you. And Lord, we pray that you might speak to our hearts. We thank you for your many, many blessings. You're so good to us, and we receive so many good things every day. We thank you for your uh, blessing and for your goodness to us, and we pray that you would just encourage us and strengthen us, and Lord, help us to just learn uh, a little bit tonight to just look to you and trust you in all things. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. amen. Three ways that God enables you to give. I think we have to start with, uh, when we talk about giving, we have to realize, of course, that God owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's all His. We had a lot of fun. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, we had Earth Day. We had T-shirts made. It, had to, it said, the earth, and it was with the globe on it. And down here it says, is the Lord's. And <laughs> we weren't quite in sync with all the earth, the earth people. But uh, the earth is the Lord's, and that's what people need to know. This globe belongs to God. He made it, and it's His, and He can disperse it and dispense it at His pleasure, and He's certainly able to do that. Exodus, or Psalm chapter 24, <clears throat> or verse 50, and verse 12, says that God owns every beast. They're all under His control. Uh, Psalm 89, verse 11, says that God owns the heavens and the earth and the world. It's all His. It all belongs to Him. And so, when we come to a passage like James 1.17, every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, uh, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good thing you have comes from God. It doesn't come from Walmart. It doesn't come from Target or Costco. It comes from God. If it's a good thing, it's from God. God made it all, and it's all His, and He is so good uh, when He gives us all that He gives us, our very breath every single day. I'm uh, encouraged when I read back in, uh, in Exodus chapter 12 about building the tabernacle. They had uh, a project. God gave them a project, the tabernacle, very unusual structure, and it uh, included some very expensive Materials. You talk about materials. You go to the lumber yard today and try to buy material. It's amazing how much things cost. Uh, but they had uh, they had a beautiful building to build, and God provided for them to build that building. Exodus chapter twelve and uh, verse thirty-five and thirty-six. says, the children of Israel did according to the word of uh, Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, <clears throat> and they spoiled the Egyptians. Isn't that amazing? Uh, if you, you ladies, if you see some lady wearing a nice piece of jewelry, to try this, say, may I borrow that? Uh, may I borrow that? Uh, oh, that, that too. Yeah, the earrings. Take the earrings along with it. 
And uh, they borrowed those things. And that's the way the Lord looked at it. They borrowed those things. And uh, God did something in the minds of those Egyptians. I don't know what it was, but he flipped a switch someplace. And they were willing to go along with this and loan them <clears throat> whatever they required. And that's what it says here. The, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lend unto them such things as they required. Oh, well, I'll have this nice coat over here, and I'll have this over here, and this, and this, and this. And they took all these things, and God enriched them, and God does, created, uh, brought about such a wealth transfer at this point that they impoverished the Egyptians. They spoiled the Egyptians. That's amazing. Amazing way to enrich a people and to prepare them to do this uh, very expensive project, but that's what God did. They borrowed from the Egyptians. In Psalm chapter 75 and verse 6 and 7, uh, our Canadians always like this passage of Scripture. Psalm 75 and verse 6 and 11 says, Promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west. Is that west? Came in in the dark and told the brother Flores we're going to drive back tonight and see what the prairie looks like in the dark. I told him I'd take a picture and text it back to him. <laughs> Promotion does not come from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. It doesn't say anything about the north. So the promotion must come from the north. The Bible says God stretches out the north over the empty place. There's an empty place in the heavens, the astronomers say, that's, that's vacant. And I've heard some deep theologians say the new city of Jerusalem is going to come through that hole in the sky to the earth. I don't know about that. But the Canadians love it that the promotion comes from the north, and apparently God's place is in the north. God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And I can't help but think about Nehemiah's day. Uh, Nehemiah was going back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. And uh, Cyrus the king underwrote that whole thing, gave them money, gave them letters of, of introduction uh, to all the, uh, the satraps in the area, and they all had to obey. They had to give him timber. They had to give him whatever he required. God can just manage his finances however he pleases. And he has all kinds of ways to transfer wealth, take it from here and put it over there. He can do that for you. And for me, I remember one time when I was in Bible college, I was a, I was a janitor, one of the janitors at High Street Baptist Church, big church, 2,000 people in attendance, and took a lot of people to keep it clean. And I made, I made 50 bucks a week working there at High Street Baptist Church. And uh, when I went back for my last year, I had a, I had a little bride with me. And uh, we had uh, we paid rent of sixty dollars a month. Times were different in those days. Well, you know, you didn't have much money. No matter how much money you make, it seems like there's never quite enough. And uh, I was sitting there one time, and the offering plate was going by, and I had uh, I had a five dollar bill in my pocket, and that was my tithe. And uh, here comes the plate. And I've got my little wife with me. You can imagine how much she eats. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, what am I going to do without this $5 bill? Should I put this in the plate or not? I, was, I really had to wrestle with myself. And I decided, well, if I'm going to be a preacher and I'm going to go out and tell people that they need to tithe and they need to trust God and do all these things, then if that doesn't work, I best find it out now than later. So the plate came by, and I, it's not a big deal, but it was a big deal to me, and I've never forgot it. And uh, I put the $5 bill in the plate. I watched it go down the line. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know what we're going to do, but there it goes. So, Lord, you have to provide for us this week. The next day, I got a letter in the mail from Denver, from my old Sunday school teacher, uh, Daryl Brown. We called him Brownie, Brownie Brown. He was a big old raw-boned, red-headed guy from Alabama. No, not Alabama. Where was it? Arkansas. 
and he had a tree service, and I worked with him before I went to college. We trimmed trees together, and uh, he was a a great guy. He's gone to heaven now, but uh, there was a $10 check in that envelope for me. Brownie had never sent me any money before, and he never sent me any later. I meant to complain later, but I forgot. But it just impressed me, you know, when you do what's right, God can provide for you. He can take care of you. God can, God can increase your income. Whether he does it in you know, grand style or whether he does it in the, on a small scale, it doesn't matter. God can increase your income. And that's a wonderful thing. God is able to increase your income. We had a lady in our church who said uh, we had a Faith Promise Missions Conference, and she got involved. She was a new Christian. She's been saved not a very long time. And she said to me later, she said, you know, I, I made a promise to give so much to missions. And she said, "Then it, no sooner than I had done that, just a week or two later, I got a raise at work, and it was the amount that I promised. And she told me the same thing the next year. <laughs> <laughs> she had promised a certain amount, and she got another raise, and it was the amount that she had promised. God is able to increase your income. We like that, don't we? How many of you like an increase in income? Yeah, we all would. God is able to do that. It's all His, and He can manage His wealth in any way He pleases. God can also... <clears throat> Decrease your outgo. It says there in the, in the Malachi 3.11 that he will rebuke the devourer. Rebuke the devourer. When I think of something devouring uh, something, I think of a wild beast of some kind. They had uh, lions in, the, in Israel in those days. A David slew a lion, and I can imagine uh, if a man had a, a flock of sheep, he'd be worried about the lions. He'd be worried about the predators who would be uh, sniffing the breeze and coming after his sheep. God said he will rebuke the devourer. I can just see this. Here comes a hungry lion. He wants his lunch, and uh, he's got his nose in the air, and he's, he smells the flock over the hill the flock of a godly man who loves the Lord and honors the Lord. And the old lion begins to make his way over the hill, and about the time he gets up to the crest of the hill, the Lord sends sends an angel down there, and uh, the angel takes the lion by his beard and says, Come on, kitty, 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 come over here. Come on, on, kitty, kitty. And uh, he takes the kitty over the hill, and he directs him to the the flock of a man who's who's not godly, not honoring the Lord, and uh, not honest with God. And uh, the lion gets his, gets his lunch there. God can rebuke the devourer. All kinds of things devour us, don't they? Everything that uh, costs you money is devouring you. I remember a man uh, in Calgary years ago, Ted Whittington. Uh, Ted got saved, got in the trade, just lived down the street from us. They were a family who'd moved from England. And uh, they taught us a lot of things about uh, English culture. She gave my wife a great big two-fisted teapot because we had church people in, and she said, you need this big teapot worse than I do. And, and we love to hear him talk anyway. But good old Ted, bless his heart, he just, he just couldn't get into this thing of tithing. And the problem he had <clears throat> was his wife. She's a sweet lady, but she was wanting to fix up the room for the kids. She was wanting to fix this, wanting to fix that, wanting to do this to the house. And uh, always complaining, well, we just we can't afford it. We just can't do this. And Ted, Ted wanted the tithe, but she wouldn't stand for it. And I remember talking to we were talking about tithing in the car. He was driving his car. We were out visiting. He'd gone visiting with me. And we came to a busy intersection in Calgary, and uh, we made a left-hand turn. And here came a car and hit the back side of his car right behind the, the driver or the passenger seat where I was, and spun that car around and totaled the car. And uh, I thought, God can get his tithe one way or another. And uh, Ted continued to have this problem. He talked to me about it every now and then. And then one day he was driving across, uh, we call it Nose Hill, big old hill, big swell in the north part of Calgary. They were 
building houses all over that hill, and there was construction equipment, and, and there were earth movers and all kinds of stuff up there. And he was driving across there. I don't know why he was up there with his car, but he was driving across that, and he got hit by an earth moving machine <laughs> and totaled a second car. And I thought, that's a, that's a hard way to learn. And uh, it was a very hard way to learn. And I don't think Ted ever did learn his lesson about that. You read about Israel in the, in the wilderness. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that their, their shoes did not wear out for 40 years. Can you imagine? 40 years. Walking on the rocks and the sands and the gravel and all that abrasive stuff there in the, in the wilderness. And their shoes lasted for 40 years. I read uh, the journals of Lewis and Clark, and they were talking about when they, they crossed the Selkirk, Selkirk Mountains, I forget, Sawtooth Mountains, anyway, Idaho, and they, they worn their shoes out, <clears throat> and they had to kill elk, of course, for meat, and they, every time they killed an animal, they'd make moccasins, and uh, they said in their journal that a pair of moccasins in that country would only last them for two days. Can you imagine? Wear out a pair of moccasins in two days. And God kept their shoes going for 40 years. Amen. God can keep your stuff going. He can Amen. bless the tires on your car. He can bless your shoes and your clothing and everything that you have and you use. Uh, we call ourselves consumers, don't we? We consume a lot of stuff. But God is able to rebuke the devourer, decrease your outgo. I remember... Before we surrendered to, to go to the mission field years ago, we had a missionary to Mexico come through our place. His name was Tommy Wetzel. Tommy Wetzel had an old Dodge that had 212 miles on it and never had had the heads off the engine. And uh, it amazed me that this missionary was driving this car for that long. God can do that. God can just make things go. And he did for Tommy Wetzel. My last year at college, I was uh, at home at Denver Baptist Temple, and I'd worked for the church knocking doors all summer, and uh, the church paid me to go back to school to get rid of me, and uh, before we went, I had, to have, I had to have a car. I didn't have a car, and I was hoping to find an automobile someplace, and I got married September 1st, and September 2nd, we left for Springfield. It looked like, uh, who are those people on TV that had all that stuff? The little hillbillies. <laughs> we had that car jam full of stuff. I think there were electrical cords hanging out the window, lamp hanging out the other window. We had all our wedding gifts in there, and uh, we, were, we were off to, to Springfield. But I'll tell you how I got that car. The week before we left, uh, Karen and I were out knocking doors with some of the teenagers in southwest Denver. And uh, Karen and I came to a door, knocked on the door, and a couple came to the door, and they were Roman Catholics, and they invited us in, just very warm and friendly. Oh, come on in. So we did. And we witnessed to them, and uh, uh, we got to telling them our story, that we were going off to Bible college soon, and didn't have a car, and we were looking for a car. And he said, oh, he said, I, just, I just traded my car. And uh, I said, if you'll go down to Maynard Ports Auto Sales on West Alameda, I'll bet he's got that car sitting out there on the lot and probably has uh, those soapy white letters on it. It probably says $99 on that car. Hey, you can't miss it. It's a Chartreuse 58 Mercury. So I thanked him, and uh, we left. And the next day, I went down West Alameda looking for a Chartreuse Mercury. And there it was. I saw the sign, kind of a hand-painted sign, Maynard Porus Auto Sales. Now I ask you, would you buy a car from a guy named Maynard Porth? <laughs> With soapy letters on the windshield, uh, the run-down end of uh, Alameda Avenue. Well, I pulled in there, and uh, I was driving the church bus. Uh, Brother Lacey let me drive the bus. I had a little short bus. And I was driving that bus around all summer. That was my transportation. So I said, I'd like to look at that uh, chartreuse mercury out there. He said, oh, okay. So he got me the key, and, and uh, I drove it uh, down to southwest Denver, down to uh, Dick Preston. Had a junkyard down there, and he dealt in uh, 
antique cars, and I knew a lot about automobiles. He was a good mechanic. And I said, Dick, I have a car out here. I've got to have a car. I've got a car. I want you to look at it, listen to it, drive it around the block, see if you think it's worth $100. And he said, what is it? I said, it's a Mercury. He said, take it back. I said, no, Dick, no, this is about my only chance. It looks like a good car. I think maybe it'll run, but I just want you to sit in it and drive it and see if you think it's any good. So he did. <clears throat> he went out, and I got in with him, and he drove it around a little bit. And he said, oh, he said, Bob, this is a peach. You better buy this. So he changed his mind, so I did. I bought it. And uh, we went off to school in that car, loaded up like I just described, and we got to school, and we prayed to the Lord, if you've got to keep this car running, because I'm a poor Bible college student, don't have any money, and I don't know what we'll do if it breaks down. So, Lord, please keep this old car running. And he did. It kept running all school year. And when it got to the end of the year, got to May, and it was time for graduation time. Pastor Lacey had come. Uh, Karen's parents had come. My mother had come. Everybody was there for the big graduation. So I had wheels. But that week, it broke down. And I, I gave it to one of my friends there. I said, you can have it. You want to fix it? Whatever you want to do with it, you can have it. I'm done with it. So uh, I gave it to him. And uh, I went through graduation, went on back. I was assistant pastor for Brother Lacey for a couple of years. And then we went off to Canyon City, started a church. And then we went to Canada. And uh, I would come back from Canada to Denver Baptist Temple and give a report and meet folks and, and uh, give a little talk. And uh, when I came back one time, one of, the, one of the young men came. He was also a student, and he was going, I think, to Baptist Bible College. And uh, he came to me and he said, you know what? He said, do you remember that old chartreuse mercury you had? Said, yeah. He said, Baptist Bible College students are still driving that thing. He said it's been passed down for three or four students, and uh, some of them are kind of mechanical, and they fix it up, and they keep it going, put a patch or a Band-Aid on it, and they've been driving it all this time. And I thought, isn't that just like the Lord. God, just take care of you. And uh, I'm going to close with this this verse. You remember in uh, Luke 6.38, I believe it is. It says give. Speaking of farmers tonight, this is the farmer's bushel. You ever see a farmer load up a bushel of beans? Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure uh, and heaped up and shaken together and uh, then heaped up. I'm misquoting it. Shall men give into your bosom. God uses other people to give to you. And I just encourage you, whether it's money or time or energy or whatever it may be, talents, abilities, God can use all those things in his churches. So I just want to encourage you to be willing to let God use you and realize that God can increase your income. He can decrease your outgo. And uh, one other thing, he may ask you to sacrifice. Elijah's widow in First Kings chapter 17 just had enough for one more cake. And she was going to prepare that cake, and her and her son would eat it and die, she said. And Elijah said, make me a little cake first. And you know the story. And uh, she went and did it. Something happened in her heart. She realized this is the man of God. She accepted his word as God's word, and it was because God told him to do that. And uh, she went, and she baked the cake, and she brought it to him. And then uh, the Bible says, then she made for herself and for her son and her whole house. They all had to eat uh, for the whole time that they were uh, under that drought. And James tells us it was three and a half years they all ate. If she had withheld it, uh, it would never would have happened. Never would have happened. The three Hebrew children, remember them? This wasn't money. This was their life. Their life. The king said, bow down to my image. And they said, be it known unto thee, O king. Uh, we're not careful to answer thee. We will not bow down to thine image. Our God is able to deliver us. And if not, be it known unto thee, O king. We will not bow down. And God blessed them. God preserved them. And uh, the fourth man was with them in the fire. And what a blessing that is. To realize that if you stick your neck out, and even if you get to the place where you think uh, you're at the end of your rope, 
Just do the right thing. And God will bless you. I remember a little African boy, a story I heard about a missionary. A little African boy came up to the missionary and he had a big bass. And he said, I brought my tithe. And the missionary thanked him for the nice fish. And he said, well, where, where are the other nine? And the little boy says, I'm going to go catch them. <laughs> so he believed God was going to give him nine more. He gave the first one to the preacher. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good men shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. God bless you. Thank you for having us here tonight. And uh, Brother Flores, where's Brother Flores? There he is. You know, as uh, how many of us, I mean, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but maybe, I don't know, but how many of us have ever wrestled the same way that Brother Garner, Garner did when he put the $5 bill and he saw it go away? I mean, I, I'm not saying it would have been $5. I mean, who knows? The Lord could have asked you to give more than that or given you, uh, asked you to give or told you to give less than that. But whatever the case, you may have felt that struggle. You might have felt that, oh, I, don't, I, I know I could use this. I, I mean, I'm, I'm almost on E in my gas tank, or the, the bills are due, or, or whatever the case might be, and you felt that wrestle with it. Well, I just, I just want to read verse number 10 from the portion of Scripture that you picked out tonight. It says, bring all your tithes into the storehouse, that, there, that they may be meat in mine house. Now listen to what God says, and prove me now herewith. God is saying, just try me. You just try me. And then really, that was the message of what Brother Gardner was saying. I mean, hey, let's just be faithful and giving, and let's just prove God. Let's just prove God. We're going to have a time of invitation now. I don't know how the Lord spoke to your heart, whether it's, whether it's through your giving or, or maybe lack thereof or whatever the case might be. Uh, so let's all stand. Let's all stand. We're going to have the piano play, and Brother Mike's going to lead us in a time.